Welcome everybody. This is Kevin Jones with the FIDA Museum. We are just waiting for the rest of our participants to log in and we'll be with you in about one minute. Thanks. Hello and welcome to our audience members attending from around the world this evening. I am Kevin Jones, curator of the FIDA Museum and delighted to host this virtual costume designer roundtable featuring five Emmy nominated designers. Typically this year, the museum would be hosting our annual Art of Television costume design exhibition. Uh, but we think bringing together these talented individuals for an in-depth discussion about their craft is the next best thing. Note that our panelists will be answering questions from uh, audience from all of you at the end of our round table. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to uh, submit your questions. And I would like to begin with a brief introduction of our esteemed guests. Natalie Brofman is Emmy nominated costume designer for The Handmaid's Tale in fantasy sci-fi category. She studied art history, costume and set design in New York and Rome before beginning her costume design career with the Canadian Opera Company. After two decades and countless projects of having worked with some of the top costume designers worldwide and having designed shows of her own, she was given the opportunity to design The Handmaid's Tale. Natalie's most recent project is Most Dangerous Game on Quibi, starring Liam Helmsworth and Christoph Waltz. This is Natalie's third Emmy nomination. Michelle Cole is the costume designer for Blackish, Emmy nominated for Outstanding Contemporary Costumes. Michelle's longstanding career in costume design includes hit shows such as In Living Color and The Bernie Mac Show. Cole has also styled major celebrities such as Madonna, Snoop Dogg, Cindy Crawford, Miles Davis, Michael Jordan, and Stevie Wonder. 
Most recently, she has been concurrently designing for Blackish, Grownish, and the new Netflix series, Hashtag Black AF. This is Michelle's seventh Emmy nomination. Sarah Evelyn is the co-costume designer for Netflix series Hollywood and is Emmy nominated for Outstanding Period Costumes. Sarah has previously worked as costume designer, uh, co-costume designer for American Horror Story with her current collaborator, Lou Eirich. Her other costume credits including, uh, include the film Fast and Furious Presents Hobbs and Shaw, as well as the popular series Ray Donovan. This is Sarah's first Emmy nomination. Congratulations. Lou Eirich uh, is also a co-costume designer for Hollywood and is uh, represented in this panel for her Emmy nomination for Best Period Costumes. Lou is most well known as Ryan Murphy's go-to costume designer for all of his projects, including American Horror Story, American Crime Story, Feud, uh, Betty and, De and Joan, Screen Queens, Glee, and Nip and Tuck. This year alone, she is nominated for three Emmys in multiple categories, Outstanding Period Costumes for Hollywood, Outstanding Contemporary Costumes for The Politician, and Outstanding Drama Series for which she is nominated as a producer for the series Pose. Lou has won a total of five Emmys and now has been nominated 14 times. Zaldi is the costume designer for RuPaul's Drag Race and is Emmy nominated for Outstanding Contemporary Costumes for the custom designs he creates for RuPaul. Zaldi began his fashion career as a runway model and has worked with companies such as Donna Karen, Shiseido, and Mac. In 2004, he became involved with Gwen Stefani's pop sheet clothing line, LAMB, where he ultimately became head designer. He has worked with music industry icons such as Michael Jackson, Beyonce, Mick Jagger, and Jennifer Lopez. Zaldi has won three Emmys, and this is his fifth nomination. So I'd like to welcome all of you, and uh, we have a, a number of questions um, to cover this evening. Let me get set up one second. So I really wanted to kind of dive into your industry and how it is that each of you work. I'm sure there's lots of crossover, but you also have your own unique way of um, working on individual projects as they come up. So I'm gonna ask some questions individually and then we also have some, some group questions. So I'm gonna start with Natalie. You started on The Handmaid's Tale as a costume supervisor and assistant designer uh, and moved to the head designer in uh, the third season. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> what, what is the differences that, uh, between uh, these positions and what has been the transition? What's, how has that been for you? Uh, well, the transition was actually not difficult at all because I was there from the very first fitting. Um, I ended up on the show actually purely by accident because I had met uh, Anne Crabtree 10 years ago mm -hmm. and we were short on crew. And I was working actually on another Margaret Atwood show and she brought me aboard to help her out. And I was sort of assistant designing, buying sort of a little bit of everything. And then the supervisor quit. And of course, everybody looked at me and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I ended up staying for two seasons doing that. So um, I had designed things before. So it was sort of just a natural progression because I was really in tune with what the show was all about because I had really been there from the very beginning of it. Um, in terms of the differences, I mean, the supervisor, costume supervisor typically is sort of the CEO, CFO of the company, uh, handles all the, you know, the, the human resources and all the finances and the accounting and the supply train and making sure the shop runs. Uh, an assistant designer typically aids the designer, uh, not so much with the design conceptual, but in terms of getting the product to the liking of, of how it should be, how, how the concept was originally. And then the designer, of course, is typically conceptual as well as other, you know, I'm very hands-on, so I got my fingers in all the pies, which I don't know how much everyone likes that, but that's just the way I work. So, <laughs> I mean, I get into the dye shop as well and just help out sometimes because it's, you know, we, we tweak and play, so. 
but uh, yeah. Well, that's, thank you. Uh, it up there. <laughs> Michelle, um, the episode that you're nominated for Hair Day is a celebration of the beauty of black hair. How closely does a costume designer typically collaborate with the hair and makeup departments on any given production? Oh, I think we, we collaborate a lot here because our show <clears throat> Blackish is about, you know, it's about the storyline, but it is a very visual sh um, show. Kenya Barrett is our creator and um, it, he's very much into the visual look of our show. So we, it's hair, makeup, wardrobe. I mean, we're very much a team. Um, we, we go through everything together. They get a board um, of what Tracy uh, Ellis Ross is wearing. So we're, we're pretty in sync together about what to do and how to do everything. So, cause it is that type of show. That's great. The collaboration is so fantastic. And so many people don't realize that, you know, when they're watching a series that there are so many individual components that have to come together to create that look for each of the characters. And it's, it's not just that they walk on screen and everything is ready and good to go. No, we, we make uh, like a board for the head of hair and makeup. We make a little board of what everybody's wearing. And um, especially Tracy Ellis Ross, because she does change her clothes quite a bit, like eight to 10 times a show. So um, her hair is done for each out for each costume. So it does take some time. One of the things that I think is really interesting is how not like real life costume design is and and how you do have to work with everybody on set because one of the things that I would think would be awful is you know you you design this beautiful green outfit uh, the hair is perfect everything the set decorator puts a green couch down and suddenly you can't see your work at all <laughs> so Sarah Lou and Lou um, your show is a revisionist narrative of Hollywood in the 1940s how has that changed or challenged you for the research and designing you have to do for a period show? Um, well, I would say that I felt like it really kind of let us soar. Like I thought that we got to play a little bit more with the color palette because it was kind of underlining a more aspirational story. And also I think that it really, you know, I th I would say we're really big researchers, but it allowed us to look really deeply into nuance and maybe like 1940s street style and what that would have been because there weren't as many um, variations to play with and really try and get behind the scenes a little bit, whether it was 54th Street in New York or in the jazz scene or it was looking at Stanley Kubrick's series of photographs that he took on the street in the 1940s. So I think that it let us like really play. How is it that you handle the huge crowd scenes? <laughs> we have an amazing key. <laughs> Ace in the hole. And can you That's describe what, what that key is? Tell, tell our audience, because we have a lot of viewers who don't know the lingo that you know. That's that, that shorthand. Yeah. Um, I would, it's a, it's a position, I mean, it can mean a lot of things in the department, but your background key is the person that essentially is in charge of running your background department, making sure that it's the look that you want, but also technically coordinating with production, with the ADs, with the locations to make sure that you also have the setup you need to dress the people and enough time and coordinating with background hair and makeup. I mean, that's another way you handle huge BC, BG scenes. You have an amazing hair and makeup team that help you like complete all the looks and help you make things look good when you're having a hard time. Um, so it's an enormous position and it's a really, really important position. And our key was this woman named Janine McKiernan and she was incredible. That's and funny. she also hired an amazing team that all had a great vision and, and we, we uh, saturated everybody with a lot of our research boards. So while they were doing fittings, they constantly had all the references around them. And um, so it, was, it got to where there were so many people and, and, and so many fittings and double up days and cross boarding that we really had to just give it to the team and um, send, them our, send them our love and <laughs> yeah, on set. And they, all, they nailed it every day. Yeah. Everything can't go smoothly. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, yeah. do you, how, how often do you present something that gets rejected and you have to start all over again? Uh, I can throw that out to all of you because I know <laughs> all the 
Hmm. Well, funnily, funnily enough, you bring that up um, because we, I, in, in the and handmaids, everything is built. I mean, we don't purchase anything uh, except for the modern clothing, and even some of that was built from scratch. But um, so essentially, what I've been doing recently is I've been posting on uh, my Instagram feed all the things that uh, sort of have a tag of things that didn't make it to camera, and you know, it's become a new hashtag now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you have these gorgeous items that everyone creates, you know, that we never see, that never get ever to see the sunlight. So, and that's such a shame. It's, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> you know? It is, but how fantastic that you can now share that in a wider context uh, with the whole world yeah. and something that just would have ended up in, in you know, in a, in a closet somewhere in a studio or wherever, your own closet. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and also that we might then end up seeing those costumes down the road in other productions, who knows? Yeah, possibly. But, so anyway, that's a fun way to show people what yeah. you have been working on. So. That's a great idea. Exactly, yeah. and, and there's so much work behind everything we know. Yeah. Nothing yeah. happens just casually. Yeah. Uh, Zaldi, um, how has the artisanry of Rue's look evolved over the time that you've been designing? To design the show or designing for Rue? Because for Rue, for Rue, you can you can answer both. Yeah. Yeah, I've been working with Rue since the Supermodel album. So back then, you know, the look was something a real showgirl type of look. You know, it was like a real. Um, it was just a different time. You know, it's like 27 years. Even with the show right now, we're in our 13th season. So it's like 13 years is a very long time of personal growth, show growth. Um, and also the audience growth and the, the field, you know, it's like, uh, you know, 13 years ago, it's like that kind of drag scene wasn't very in your face. It wasn't really like, a glow. it was out there, but it kind of lost a lot of, of its glamor. And um, it wasn't even, I think, until like the later seasons of Drag Race, like episode six and seven, where people really started to notice. And like, you know, the more people, get in on it, then the more inspiration there is and the more beauty and creativity is out there. So, you know, we are also also evolving along with everybody else just because it's just been so long. <laughs> I mean, it's just been like years. Right, are you having to circle back at all and, and you know? Always, always, because, you know, it's like when, when I just have a singular muse, you know, it's like um, we, we always look back. We always look back and, you know, and Rue, certainly loves certain things and silhouettes and just the way you would bring things back in in fashion in your cycle you know it's like when you have almost three decades of uh of language with each other it's like things always come back around and it's uh, i mean sometimes it's the original piece you know like rue started throwing in like every now and then she's like i'm gonna wear this dress you know that i designed like for her 90s vh1 talk show you know like just out of the feels like it, you know, like that's her mood. And I was like, that's great, you know? Um, so everything is 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 up for um, for seeing again, so. Including being ripped apart, reworked, re no, 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 nothing ever gets, nothing ever gets, everything's archived, you know, like wow. absolutely everything is archived, you know, in that's one great. gigantic room, so. So I have a question for all of you. Um, with your current nominations for the television series, uh, what particular characters or story arcs uh, were you looking forward, each of you looking forward to working on, or those that were posed um, unexpected challenges, you know, and how did your design process play into that? <laughs> Any particular character you absolutely love, and you, you're like, I can't wait to dress you, or a character you're like, oh, I wouldn't get, just get through this and move on. <laughs> and be honest. <laughs> we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, uh, go ahead. Oh, Sarah and I had a lot of fun with Patty Lapone because she oh, yeah. um, is ju she's just very daring and she's very open and and um, we just put on some '40s music and she would be just like clothes were flying in the room. Like she just wanted to try it all on. She's such a theater person and a musician and she's singing in the fittings and she just, she's very thorough and it's not like constant looking at your watch or your phone, like, can I get out of here? And so we really enjoyed 
collaborating with Patty and coming up with her looks, which were high contrast from the rest of the cast. She looked so amazing too, and was so amazing. You know, She's yeah. amazing. Oh, and her co costumes were so beautiful. Oh. I mean, she was so believable in that character. I mean, I just, I loved it. Great She's job. our hero. Great job, great job. <laughs> it was fun working with Holland too, actually, because I felt like oh, yeah. she had a different, like very nuanced sense of the 1940s. I mean, they were a great pair, you know, like, we loved, I think, also that Patty was sexy, that she was a 360 degree woman. You know, she was powerful, she was sexy, and she was older. And Holland was her own version of that. And I think it was really fun for us to be able to explore that. And plus, Holland has a lot of attachment to the 40s. She remembers her mom vividly. She brought in pictures of her and, like, really had a sensibility about where a hat would go or what kind of brooch she might wear. And I felt like that elevated us. Like, it was, a, it, they were both excellent collaborations. Yeah. We had a great cast. Mm -hmm. So how often does, do the actors that you work with play into your love of dressing a character? I mean, there's got to be times where you've got, you don't have to name names, but you know, you, you want to move on or, or that, just, that, that character, that actor is just not feeling it. How, how do you work around that? Because that's the, you know, it's the behind the scenes real life that, that we don't see on screen because everything is flawless. Well, me typically what I do is um, I have a long conversation with the actors when I first meet them. Also, where they where where they see their character going and what they're comfortable in. Like for example, I'm not going to put a woman in a pantsuit if she hates trousers. So, and that's not she won't her acting will suffer from it because it she's uncomfortable. So you modify and you work together. And I love having that kind of input from them. Of course, there are times when there's too much input and then you have to kind of draw it back. Uh, but you have to find reasons of why you're able to draw it back and be very diplomatic about it because that's. 90% of the, the, the problem, if there's a problem. So it's just have to keep it smooth and just work with people. And come up for a reason why you think they should be in a pantsuit as opposed to a skirt. And then sometimes they go, oh yeah, maybe you're right. You know, so it's a, it's a conversation, that's all. I agree with Natalie. I, I totally, I'm on the same page. It's, it's that, that's how you do it. That's yeah. You try to find the, the piece in it, you know, how to make this work. Yeah. I had and to, the and yet they trust you, you know, your actor has to trust you and, and um, they have to have exactly. experience and if they trust you, they know that you're, you know, you have their best interest. I, I believe you, most of us were here because you have their best interest. You want them mm -hmm. to look good. Mm -hmm. so that's the, that's the goal. Yeah. Or, or bad if the character requires it, you know, exactly. so, it's, but it has to become a character driven choice as opposed to just, well, I think you look great in blue and you right. hate blue. So it's, you know, it's that kind of a thing. Uh, in terms of your other question just before that you had asked, I think um, on my show, I think that one of the hardest things that I had to deal with was winter. And we kept putting all the girls in water <laughs> in the middle of winter. So um, I had to, I think the hardest thing on my show in terms of costuming was how to disguise keeping someone from having hypothermia in terms of with wetsuits and waders and yet making it still an elegant costume that fits the storyline, which is something that we never see on screen often. Uh, it's and it doesn't get discussed much, but you're confronted with this kind of a problem that in December 20, you know, 3rd, you're going to put someone in the lake in Lake Ontario, for example, that kind of a thing. So it's, uh, those are the kind of costumes that you just want to rip the bandaid off and not have to deal with them anymore, just get them over with, you know? <laughs> so, and then also the psychology comes into that as well, because when you do put something like that on someone, you grow in size and that makes someone uncomfortable, of course, right? Nobody wants to be fourth dress sizes larger. So there's a lot of, <laughs> Trick of the <laughs> so. How often do you, you know, in those kinds of instances, have to talk your actors through what's going to be required of them to be able to be in character, but also safe at the same time? Um, you know, are there practice sessions beyond the fitting sessions? I mean, like once you actually get to set, you're, you're in an outside location or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, do you, do you, do you have practice sessions with the actors to make sure they understand what's happening with their costumes and why? Well, in one specific scene, there was another scene where um, Emily, one of the younger characters who escaped Gilead, she had to cross a river with a baby. Uh, that happened, that was a night shoot. And of course it was a raging river and this happened, this was at the end of November. So it was equally freezing. 
Um, and they actually did a dry run. Well, not it wasn't dry. She was in the water, but it was a daytime practice rehearsal with cables and all the stunt people. And we had the most amazing stunt coordinator um, and her stunt person. And then they would walk her through that to make sure that it was safe and that she felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. I mean, nonetheless, it's still terrifying to have to go do that anyway, even though you know it's make-believe. So that's the kind of dry runs you do. We did um, our dry, our hair uh, episode is that we rehearsed with all of, you know, they had sneakers on the dancers. And so we rehearsed all of that prior to that scene um, with Jill Scott. So we did the same thing as well, but not in freezing cold weather. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just particular to this show. <laughs> I'm visualizing. I'm like, I can't even imagine that at night. Oh, I mean, I can't even imagine the courage that these ladies had. But I mean, in, in what you were just saying, though, dancing in sneakers, it's it's really tough because it's, it, it's the rubber just doesn't slide very well. And it's a whole... like two or three inch sneakers, you know, so they were like, at, like the little, you know, heels. Yeah. You know, and, they, and we also not to get when we did Prince, everything was designed for Prince when we did that show, and right. so um, they really had to rehearse with all of that, and and um, so it was, it's important that they feel like she said it feels that they feel safe, they feel good in it, so it's important. So that could also move up your for um, needing to have your costumes ready. Sorry. I'm sorry. That would also move up your timeline, I would think, of, of, of having to have your costumes ready because of having to incorporate in practice sessions, both with stunt people, with the, the, uh, the, the crew around the, 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 the costumes, but also for the costumes themselves. Mm -hmm. And many multiples. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Are there multiples for the stunt individuals or backups in case something gets wet, gets whipped, gets soiled? Uh, during one of these practice sessions? A little bit of both. And we actually came up with this. I discovered this product last year. Um, it's a silicone-based product that it looks absolutely dripping wet, but it's dry and it's still malleable. Uh, so we actually created one of these dresses for her because she had to lie on the river bank for a little bit and resuscitate this baby. And to have someone lie around in a wet, soggy dress, even if for 10 minutes or five minutes is too much. So you have to come up with other solutions so that's what we did on our in that particular scene so yeah we had to think about 10 dresses for her just for that one sequence plus another four for the stunt person mm. so, uh, <laughs> you know, so yeah <laughs> lou i have a question for you um you serve as both a costume designer and producer on maya murphy's productions what is the significance of of these dual roles and how does it help you with your costume design process well, it's evolving all the time. Um, about three years ago, Ryan just came to me and said that he would love to give me producer credit on his shows because I'd been with him at that time, 17, 18 years, to um, better, to, to show graciously from him um, the recognition for what I do for him and his company. Um, and it got to where Ryan was doing for a while, it was just one or two shows a year. And then all of a sudden, it was three, four, five, six, seven a year. And I obviously couldn't design them all. And um, uh, so we ended up just coming up with the plan of um, taking somebody already within the Brian Murphy community and bumping them up. And I would watch, they would like work under me for a little bit. And then I would leave to the next show. So I would just leapfrog. And each person would elevate up to the co-designer which worked when we were doing two or three shows, but then when it, it got to be too many, um, I had to just put in people on the shows and I would just start, I just started to slowly oversee them all, mm -hmm. um, which works when I'm not also designing, but like this last year, I fully designed two of the movies and it did prove to be, to break me a little bit. I was really hard with like Sarah, luckily with Hollywood, um, we started out together when I wasn't too busy yet and we were able to really work on all the characters and work with Ryan before he started directing the prom and, um, and, and felt like we had a really great place and I was able to leave and Sarah and the team took over and did great. And I would jump in and visit, tried to every day, but didn't always work that way. Um, but like, yeah, it's, it's ever evolving. And um, I think what helps me is that I, 
can actually have an office where I can now read each show scripts and read all the, I can't, I can't still read all the call sheets for every show because my brain won't hold it anymore, but I do read all the schedules and know what's going on. And um, it's a little harder with Pose in New York now because the time difference means that it's like very early to very late, but um, I love it. <laughs> I, I do really love working with all these designers. And, and I would say what I love the most about it is I still learn, I'm still learning both I get to learn from other this, these other designers coming up through the ranks and, and their new perspective, especially tech, technology, because it's not my strong point. But um, I love learning that, and I love learning what producers do, because I don't really know, um, even though I married the one. But um, I... I don't think it. I don't think it really helps the process of designing, but it helps me open up my world more, and it's been great. And I think Ryan well, Murphy. It's a terrific way of of helping, as you mentioned, a, a, a younger generation uh, get real meaty, hands-on designing experience. To be able to, you know, do that is fantastic. Yes, except it's not. I want to make sure that it's not just the younger generation. Mm -hmm. It's. It's anybody. It, it doesn't matter if they're younger or older. It's some, basically, the big theory is it's somebody who can't get that bump up on their own. They, they've assisted for years and can't get a design credit or can't get an agent. And they've been doing this for a long time and they keep getting small pictures and can never get an agent. It's just giving somebody that bump up that could really use it, I guess, is the way to say it. Sarah, um, for Hollywood, are the, the, the costumes, are they a mixture of vintage rentals, builds? Um, how do you find such a volume of period dress that can't all just be real clothes from the period? How, how do you deal with that? Um, well, actually, it, it was definitely a mix. And at the time that we were doing Hollywood, I feel like there were something like 12 productions between here, Europe, and Canada that were doing 1930s, 1940s, or 1950s. So everyone was up in our clothes. <laughs> and there was like, it was like a desert in the costume houses. Um, we dug really deep into vintage contacts. One thing that's amazing working with Lou and all like, I feel like, my brother and sister designers in the Ryan Murphy world is like, there is this incredible, um, there are these incredible resources and Lou has been building these vintage resources for years and years and years. So we called everyone and asked them if they knew anyone and asked them if they had a grandma anywhere that had a box of clothes in her basement. We'll take it, we want it. We, I mean, across, really like across the world, we looked. And then, and that was really how we got the stock for our background, I'd say. And then for our principles, a lot of what we built because I feel like clothing in regular sizes doesn't, from the 1940s, doesn't really exist or clothing that you need someone to wear for a couple days in a row, it's going to fall apart. So we had this incredible cutter fitter um, named Joanne Mills, who, and an incredible made to order person, Kit Scarbo, who just like, I mean, they were such a phenomenal team. Our whole team was really amazing, but I felt like having a really strong cutter fitter, who of course came from Lou, and having a really strong made to order person and an ACD who deeply understood made to order meant, and being in LA meant that we literally could be like, Patty needs something new to wear day after tomorrow. Okay, one, two, three, go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and shout out to Tiger Curran, our yeah, Tiger ACD, Curran. because she was an ace, also ace in the hole, and our okay. supervisor, Susie Freeman, could yeah. not have done it without them. Our whole team like could not have done it without our team. <laughs> Here, I think you brought up an interesting point that probably a lot of our viewers would not be aware of. And honestly, until this moment, I kind of never, it never clicked with me. I don't work in the industry, totally museums, right. but the competition. So <laughs> you're not just, I mean, great. You're designing, each one of you designs your, your projects and they're fantastic, but there's so much else going on in the Hollywood community here, but also everywhere else around the world where filming takes place, that if you do have to go to a, a vintage 
a dealer or a rental warehouse, that you are also working against all of your other colleagues if indeed there is a call for every 1955 prom dress in the world all of a sudden. Totally. And that's the way it works, actually. There's definitely a collective <laughs> conscience and everyone is always doing the same period at the same time. Yeah. And you do. You really have to think about it. When you're holding racks and racks, you've got to think twice. Do I want this stuff? Do I need this stuff? Because I know that someone else will use right. it, you know? And I'd also say, bringing Michelle into the loop on this one, is that it's the same with contemporary, because a lot of us are shopping from the same malls, the same stores. We'll see each other at Bloomingdale's all the time, and <laughs> you know, like, okay, steer, from, steer clear of the theory, because Michelle's over there. <laughs> We're kind of always like, all shopping from the same shops, and then learning how to just style it differently, and, and, and also finding a lot of, um, uh, vendors outside of the mall and, and giving a lot of the young new not young uh young to the business designers right. and giving them uh, a lot of our attention as well well this actually leads into a question perfectly about this uh, not just competition but multiple product projects going on at once so michelle you know how do you balance your work on blackish simultaneously designing grownish and hashtag black AF. I mean, do you have teams that work across all three productions? I have, like Lou said about her team, you, have, you can't do this by yourself. I mean, it takes a village to do these shows. Always, and yeah. It is a lot of work, you know, but I love it. I love the work. I have such a passion for this. So this is a huge part of my life. And um, I have a great boss, you know, Kenya Barris is the creator. And so um, Gronish is up, you know, so Gronish, I don't usually do three shows when they're all brand new. I don't do that. I, my shows have to be up and running. So Gronish was on its third season, Blackish was on its sixth season, and then Black AF was on its first season. So that's the way that I like to work because um, you can't do three new shows. It's way too much work when you, right, Lou? <laughs> <laughs> but do you have three different teams on each show? I have three different teams on, on each show, yes. Um, so. That way, because it gets you. Ne you never know what your day is going to be like, you right. know. So Tracy might want to do her fitting, but it was interesting because even though I had Rashida Jones on Black AF and I had Tracy over over at um, Blackish and I had Yar over at Gronish, their fittings were never the same time. So it, it just worked out, you know. Yeah. It just worked out that way. And I never take shows that are very far from me. Um, they're like maybe ten miles. So. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a last minute thing, I can always run to the studio and Gronish is right next, I'm at Blackish right now, Gronish is right next door. So mm -hmm. I have a bicycle that takes me back and forth. So it, it, it works out and I've, I've always kind of done two and three shows. So my team likes me best when I'm working two and three shows. <laughs> and <laughs> also sounds uh, like it keeps you incredibly physically fit. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> But it is, it's really creative and it's a lot of fun. But you, I, you know, I have Stanley Hudson who was runner up for Project Runway. So he handles, you know, he helps me with Blackish. So you have all these great people, and costumers that help you. So you can't do it by yourself. It takes a lot, of, a lot of hard work. Now, Lou mentioned about new technologies. And just before we went live, we were kind of having a quick discussion about the use of Zoom, you know, and if you like Zoom or don't like Zoom. Now, ha has anybody started into Zoom fittings, you know, you, you can't be in two places at once, but you, you maybe can be split screen, um, like with Zoom. I did it before when it used to be Skype, uh -huh. and I did it so much. And I know a lot of my friend, like designer friends are doing, you know, fittings with models in Milan, and it's with like a little Zoom room of like 15, 20 people, and like nobody wants the same thing because it's too noisy and it's it's really so I haven't done it and I wouldn't want to do it either. <laughs> I don't think it can replace the human touch. No, I agree. And the conversation and the chemistry you have with the person that you have standing in front of you. I mean that in itself is such a rare thing if you have if it's a simpatia, it's it's golden. I mean it's that's that's what we all strive for, no? So mm -hmm. I don't know, I think that would take it away. I've done FaceTime fittings, but they're not the same. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, put your jeans on. You know, it's like it's not <laughs> so yeah. That's me. Me too. Goldie, um thinking about the number of people that are uh, in RuPaul's productions 
And I, I'm curious, do, do any of the contestants, do they dress themselves or yeah. are they all vetted through you and through RuPaul? No, no, they're on their own. It's like uh, a real competition, you know, like they have to do their own things or come with things that they kind of know are, would be useful to them. So yeah, there's no vetting. It's not like, you know, there might be a theme of, you know, like for a promo where you're all wearing neon, you know, but nothing, you know, everything else is a big surprise. So it's all seen when it first comes out. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, everybody, it's like, yeah, it's a big reveal every time. <laughs> so. And that can be great, but I'm sure it can be really scary for you. <laughs> I mean, you know, but that's part of the excitement too. Yeah. Like, you know, it's the unexpected, you know? And, um, I think it's I think it's exciting, you know, because it's it's a competition show. It it, it feels like um, you want that kind of unexpected moment to happen. Mm -hmm. Natalie, um, I think it's interesting that in our current climate, that the Handmaid's costumes are now appearing kind of as a symbolic form of protest. Um, mm -hmm. How does it feel to see the shows resonating so profoundly with your audience? And it's really through those costumes. Yeah, it's through the costumes. And then in the third season, there was an added layer of where basically women's voices were taken away. Um, any sort of, can, you know, to create any sort of, of subterfuge was taken away. So there's no whispering, there was no, and uh, I, with that extra piece that was added, I, I was trying to also create a sense of being shackled um, acoustically as well as visually. Um, it's all just very suffocating. Um, and it's, it was interesting when we, when we were in Washington, at one point we, had, we were broken for lunch and the girls were lining up to hand in their capes so that they wouldn't get, I don't know, marinara sauce on them or whatever. And uh, um, actually that would have been the only costume where it wouldn't have made a difference because it was red. <laughs> <laughs> it's always tuxedo day and spaghetti day. Anyway, <laughs> um, and I was sitting on the bench and just overhearing the girls um, you know, speaking amongst themselves, just saying, oh my God, I can't believe we're part of this big movement. And that was the first time it really struck me as what we were doing. Because when you're in a shop, especially one with no windows, um, on hours on end, you're sort of removed a little bit from all the news and all the, I mean, you see it sort of in fleeting or you hear it in the car, but that's about it. And it's, it's just, it was, it's just incredible because it's it's like a Gandhi-esque form of resistance. It's quiet, but it's a massive presence. And you cannot ignore it because it's not only in red, but there's just so many of them. Right. So it, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's, it, it, it takes my breath away when I see something like that on TV, and especially with so many women doing it at the same time. It's just, you know. It's, it shows to me the power of costume design. Yeah. I know that you all, every one of you, plan and plan and work and work and you, you try to make sure that everything is just ready to go for the director when they say action. And that's all the practice sessions, that's the harnesses, that's the stunt, everything. Mm -hmm. And then there's something that goes beyond that. When it reaches the audience, it goes out into the ether and it can touch everybody in ways that I'm sure none of you could ever plan for. And I'm sure each of you have that moment or moments in your careers where suddenly the costumes go beyond what you initially thought of just creating the character for a moment on screen. Yeah, for sure. And I just, I, I applaud you, you know, for that because you're, you're definitely grabbing something um, more than just cloth. You know, and that's that's the amazing aspect of creativity. Um, well, I mean, throughout history, it's always been an indicator of socioeconomic times of whatever period you look at the shape and whatever they're wearing tells you exactly what's going on in that society. Mm -hmm. And we are translating that into the story, giving a vision to the director's vision. We're, we're making it three dimensional, which is an amazing way to tell a story. So it's. It's a pretty awesome job, <laughs> I must say. <laughs> now, you all have touched on um, creating these outfits and you don't do it yourself and you rely on your teams. I think it'd be very interesting for those who want to get into the industry or are um, just fascinated by 
the costume design world to know what your departments are like. You know, um, how many do you have on staff? What is a normal number, team number uh, on, a, on a production? I mean, my one, Rue, it's like, you know, because Rue is my, he's my star. And, you know, I mean, we do do three shows a year, you know, and last the year before we did five shows together in a year. Um, but I have a pretty small team. It's like I have two designers that work with me and then um, there are other assistants and uh, fabric designers and print designers, graphic designers. Um, but, and then if it's, we have to do any more things, you know, I have an extended family um, that I also reach out to, to help. Um, but it's pretty small, you know, it's like, it's just maybe like my studio with like five people working on the scene. You know, just for about like, you, not, not for like like a Cirque du Soleil. You know, I have like yeah, <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, that's the thing. Is I think a lot of viewers, you know, if they if they're especially with really grand costumes that have obviously taken a lot of time to sequin and embroider and and so forth, you know, they think that there's just like hundreds of people um, to, to do all of this. And that's not the reality. Maybe, but uh, we can't afford 100. It's <laughs> <laughs> a budget. You know. Never enough. <laughs> no, no, never. Michelle, Sarah, I mean, what are your teams like? What are the numbers? And I know that you all call on all sorts of other specialists um, that don't necessarily work directly with you. And it's just for something that maybe you need for a specific episode or a specific stunt or something like that. But what are your team numbers like? Um, every show is different because comedy is different. We, it takes us five days. So we get our script on Monday. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of trying to tell you the answer a little bit here is that we start on Monday and we're done by Friday. Every Monday, every Friday, we're 22 minutes show. So for us, it took, it, we'll sit in Monday morning, we'll sit right here and we'll go through the script, we'll go and it's like, go. And so there's quite a few, there's, I probably have seven um, people. So everybody's going into seven costumers, so everybody's going into a different direction because by, by Wednesday morning, I'm doing fitting. So my tailor can start doing alterations. So my schedule is very different than maybe the rest of the team here is that it's up and running, it's really fast. So you, you know, you're up on Monday, the tra it goes by the time Friday hits, I have the whole rack going over to the trailer to be, um, to be shot on Monday. And then I'm already working on the next script. So it's pretty fast. Michelle, I have a question. So what happens if, so on, if you're doing two shows at once, is Monday the day for both shows that you, so you would have that meeting on both shows with the new script for both shows? Because Monday, because, and the producer who does um, Blackish and Grownish, He's the, he, it's the same producer. So he does it for his schedule when he can meet. So yeah. because Blackish is, they all have their meetings and then Gronish has their meeting. And then AF, um, mostly Devin Patterson was my supervisor. She does the meeting. Yeah. So, but, um, but we have it scheduled out where Blackish and, and Gronish do not, um, they don't clash at all. Mm. So it, work, it works out. Thank God we had the same producers. I think uh, those, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think it really matters per show, and you kind of have yeah. to be the personality of the show. Like, I mean, Michelle, that sounds like so daunting to me, you know? But I think that, like, on Hollywood, for example, when you're crossboarding and you're doing double up days and triple up days and you have huge BG mm -hmm. scenes, this is also when your crew really starts to expand. And it's like the more crew you have, then the more people you need to help supervise a crew. So mm -hmm. it really is like, I feel like crew size becomes exponential and it's based on the personality sort of of the production are you going to get your scripts ahead of time are you going to cross board you know are you going to have big bg scenes and if you have all three of those you have a really big crew hopefully <laughs> gromish has a bigger crew because we do two shows we cross board we do two shows a week oh, so yeah. it's busy it is and um but we you know, we did it and you somehow you manage and you hopefully have a great you know the best team ever right yeah yeah um, I have gone through my questions and I would love to open this up now to questions from our audience members. And so this is kind of across the board 
uh, for all of you. And seriously, I'm just gonna just kind of go down the list. Um, uh, first question is, um, let me see. It is, uh, would love to know um, what each of your favorite or most memorable costume design moments have been in your careers. Wow. And I'm gonna combine this with another question. Has, has something like a favorite piece been morphed into another costume design in another production? <laughs> Remember, this is the audience. These are their questions. I have a favorite shape I tried to bring into every show somehow. Um, okay. Tends to be a long draggy type shape. Um, a female garment, uh, and it always shows up in some shape or form. Or uh, so that is something I I tend to repeat or bring into each. That would be my favorite garment always. It's a specific shape where you have a bias triangle in the back of a a, a skirt, and then the draw of that is just so much longer when it's in, on the bias because of the uh, the pull. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that the question can, you know, be morphed like, do you have a signature, you know, and mm -hmm. Natalie, it sounds like you, that is a signature aspect within your design. Yeah. Anybody else? I mean, you know, I, I, not that that was my favorite costume, but maybe my favorite costume moments would have had to been with Michael Jackson be, right before we were going to go to London. And I was fitting his new LED outfit on him that he hadn't, he'd only seen me working on it um, in the Netherlands. And um, I put it on him in this dark fitting room at the forum, you know, and then I sort of like turned the light switch on and it was doing all the fun patterns it's supposed to do. And he didn't say a word, you know, it just was silence completely for like, feel felt like in a very uncomfortable minute and I had no idea what was going on. And then he just, you know, and I'm not starstruck at all, but you know, when you're with, when I was with him, I was like, oh my God, that's Michael Jackson. You know, it's like, and he's, he's standing there and then he finally goes, it's everything I've always wanted. It's everything I've always wanted. And then like, <laughs> I was like, it was just a wonderful, wonderful moment to see somebody so excited about something we've been building and working on for months. You know? Yeah, nice, nice. I think mine is, um, I mean, when you work on In Living Color, everything is, is a lot of fun. And I think maybe men men on um, with everything that they've done was probably some of my favorites. Uh, mm -hmm. of to see two straight men with married with children going into that mode was just priceless. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that was probably some of my favorites. I mean, everything on that show was my favorite, but those seeing those two guys on a personal level and then seeing them in front of the camera do it was we would all go to the set just to watch them yeah mm. i have so many favorites and it changes all the time and like when sarah and i were doing hollywood um every every 40s movie i watched i just fell in love again with all the clothes and i never tired of that silhouette and i often do it incorporated into my own looks here and there i go through cycles but I think one show that movie that really always stuck with me was The Hunger. I loved Catherine Deneuve's look um, and David Bowie and um, I can watch it over and over again and, and the nuances of it where the color palette, everything about it. And I've often looked back to that Catherine Deneuve silhouette and, and um, when I'm stuck on something, I'll go back and it always inspires me. A cream wool coat with a Marcusite throat. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Genius. So yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Uh, all of it. So well done. It sounds like all of you pull from your past love of movies. The watching things as you've grown up and they've stayed with you. And then you find yourself in a position that you get to influence the, the next generation of movies that we all see. And that's going to then influence three year olds that when they grow up, they're gonna be looking at your films and, and loving them and are, are then going to be influenced. And, and it's an exciting uh, process, I think. Um, that aspect of, of design and, and its continuation and how it feeds on itself. Yeah. Daldi, I have a question specifically for you. Um, 
as a Filipino American, did you have any challenges assimilating into American culture and emerging in the fashion industry as a minority? Um, not that I was aware of, you know what I mean? I've always been sort of like, I always seem to have some form of adversity sort of on me, you know, it's very like androgynous, very colorful, very whatever. Um, but everything always seemed to work to my own advantage. Um, and I never really cared and I never tried to please anybody, you know, other than myself. So in that way, so I don't think there was anything to my own knowledge. Um, you know, there was, when I started out as a model, there were definitely jobs I didn't get because they were like, we don't want a brown person. You know, it's like, it was definitely that, you know, but um, not in my professional career when it's about my, 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 my craft. It wasn't, never, never. I think that's because possibly, correct me if I'm wrong, but the creative industries are much more often embracing. Um, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why I love working in the museum field, because I am, I am, I, I see cultures all over the place. I get to examine their clothes, time periods, you know, hundreds of years. It, you know, it's not just a, a one-off kind of situation. And I, I, I love the, the creative industries for that reason. Uh, yeah. That hopefully, you know, I'm glad that you, you have said what you've just said. And Michelle, not, not to point you out, but I would like to ask the same question. It wasn't directed to you, but, you know, um, ha have you had any problems in the industry or has it been embracing for you? Um, I started almost 40 years ago, so it was, it was different, you know, and we have like um, Sharon Davis, Ruth Carter, Francine, Sassy, we've all had these conversations together, you know, there was only a few of us starting, you, you know, when we first started 40 years ago. And, you know, and I'm so happy to see the doors open to so many people. And one of the things I wanted when I first started and became a costume designer, I was about 30 years old. And I said, the one thing I want to do before I leave, leave this entertainment world was to open the door to everybody, um, to open the door to Filipinos, open the doors to just everybody who's good, who has a passion for this. So. It was the blacks, you know, brown skin. It's to everybody. I mean, this is, it's not a business of whites. It's a business of artists, you know, creative beings, you know. So that's what I, that's what I really wanted to open the door. I want, and I hope, I hope that I've managed to do that by having PAs that come into my office. And Lou and I, we have these conversations of, you know, how to, how to open the doors for all kinds of really good people who really want to do this, you know, who have a passion to do this. So we, I think a lot of us get a lot of phone calls of how to open the, the door for other people. So, and there's a lot of them out there that are talented. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for that, I appreciate it. Um, for all of you, what would you say is the most important part of your job? Mm. I all right. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Yourself and uh, a certain quality of life because it's like, it's, it's so much work, I think, that we all do. And we spend so many extra hours doing it that there has to be something grounding to, to make me feel like I'm not just a big work force. You know, it's like I need to have to know that my life is it's enjoyable too. You know, like, I mean, I enjoy my work. But I need that. I need that time, you know, to make sure that I, I can go into my work with a with a clear, open mind. I was gonna say, I think the most important thing about my job is being a collaborator. Like being a collaborator with my director, being a collaboration with production, being a collaborator with hair and makeup, being a collaborator with my crew. You know, asking them for their magic and uplifting that. And honestly, to what Zaldi said, being a collaborator with my family, with my husband who really helps and my parents and my kids, it really, it's like, it's building a team 360, I think, and seeing everyone's magic and asking them to see mine in like a really open and vulnerable way, I think. Well said, Sarah. I think <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> what she said. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. That's a good one. Thank you. So, no, well, I'm sorry, but like also to know when to stand your ground and when to be flexible. You know, I, I sometimes my car is parked um, really close, and there's times that I'll go sit in my car, like, um, and just detox. I need five minutes to detox, and um, I'll write. I'll write. I have a journal in my book in my car. So I'll start writing or start playing around or start doing things like that. And that's how I, that's sometimes my balance. And I have my bicycle and then the equestrian center is right down the street. And sometimes I'll just ride my bike to the equestrian center because I need to see nature. You know, mm -hmm. I need to see something else, you know, mm -hmm. and then I'll ride on my bike back. So I think you have to have a balance. Um, it, is a lot, it is a lot of work. You have to really love this. Um, you're here first thing in the morning, you're here, you know, late at night. So you have to, you have to, you have, to have the faith and you also have to love this. My, my experience has been with, uh, I, in the last 20 years I've collected, I, I haven't collected them, but we sort of gravitated towards each other as this collective team that creates this, the most amazing craft and alchemy. And, and when you, and a lot of them are very shy and they would never, you know, show their work or they were, wouldn't be allowed to build things. And what I love is when you, when, when you, you allow someone to be also creative with you, so in, in terms of being together and then watching that person shine because they've just created this great thing, whether it's a beautiful hat or shoes or a beautiful garment or, you know, beautiful breakdown dyeing work or any of that. And, it, and it, it's just amazing to bring a team together and especially if everyone loves each other, which is a very important thing. And I finally, finally have arrived where I've got a great team where everyone respects and loves each other and has each other's back for everything. And it's so rare, you know, yeah. it's, and everyone jumps in wherever they're needed. If someone's falling behind, people jump in and go here, let, let me take that, you know, I'll, I'll help you with that. We'll get it done. Yeah. So that's, that's amazing. That's what I love about my job. <laughs> what I've learned as one of the most important things is similar to that is just listening, listening yeah. to the director, listening to your crew. Uh, it, it goes a long way when people know they're being heard, especially in your crew and especially the hierarchy of a crew. It's, it's making sure everybody feels heard, but also listening. And it's hard when you've got 10 things going on and a lot of things and, and you can miss things so quickly and it could have been an important piece. So it's something I've really worked on the last like two years is just really listening and uh, then translating what I've heard. Uh, I have a question from a, a FITM graduate and uh, she's done a, a lot of things in the industry. She's been working for two years, uh, been trying to get into the union. I think her question is interesting is, is how can I become part of your team working under you? And she points out you specifically, Lou, um, you know, as kindly just, uh, how, how is it that you find the individuals that you need? Are your groups, your teams kind of set or do, how often do they change? Um, and then what do you look for when you are, you're the boss and you're going to hire somebody? This is for me personally. She mentions you, your name, because she, she, uh, she has admired you and also worked uh, for uh, pulling costumes for Hollywood uh, and so forth. So gave that as an example and with your name on it. But I think this is open to everybody. You know, what do you look for when you are going to hire? For me, it's a uh, getting into the unions is really a hard. It, it breaks my heart. There's so many talented people that are coming out of school and and or don't don't have school but have talent, um, and that that struggle of getting in. And unfortunately, the best way is being a PA for a year or two or three. And most of most of my team has come from the ground up, PAing for a year or two or three till, and, and I can see who's got the passion, who doesn't, who really is going to stick it out and not. Then we get them into the union and then they work in the 705 for a few years and decide, I want to be a customer. I want to be a supervisor. I want to be a, an assistant designer and eventually design. 
and and again it's listening and talking and and a lot of it's instinct too you can tell when somebody has that drive um that for me it's a lot of instinct also um it's it is i mean i'm gonna open this up and i'm <laughs> it's gonna be a funny thing for me i know in a week but it, it i can't hire you if i don't know you so you have to send an email and sometimes i can answer sometimes i can't but you know familiarity uh, I, I get to know your name i get to hear what you've been up to and and i i you never know next week i might need somebody so it's a lot of that or someone will call you know michelle sarah we have a network all the time i need a shopper i need a new pa i need a supervisor and we're sharing names within our network all the time and if we don't know you we can't hire you so um that would answer the question of how I'm always looking for new people. We're always looking for new people. And um, and yes, I have a big, we have a big family that we all just kind of move like a puzzle pieces, like, okay, Sarah's gonna go over here and Paula's gonna go over there. And so if that's five five shows, we need crew for five shows. So it's, it's there is no formula that I have. It's a lot of instinct and, and a lot of, like how I got in, it's just um, being in the right place at the right time and never giving up that hope. Never, if it's, it is your passion, it will happen. And that sounds all woo woo, but it is to me, just stick it out, go for it. Pick your favorite designers, take that chance, send them an email and um, you never know. It could, it could be, if it's your dream, it'll happen. Yeah. Michelle, Sarah? Are you saying no, no, no? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a PA sitting right next to me, uh -huh. laughing. She's 21, just got out of college. She bothered me for a whole year. She called <laughs> right here sitting next to me, and she's laughing, listening to it, because she, she's like with Lou. She's like this, going, that's right, that's right. And it does, like you said, it, it's bothering us and doing, you know, getting in there. You know, like if you have a passion for this, keep going, keep don't give up. Like Lou said, don't give up. Mm -hmm. But she called me for a good year talking to me. And finally I said, come on in, Let, let's do it. <laughs> and, and, and it happened. We've been here a month. <laughs> <laughs> Two months. <laughs> I think for me, it's also when I meet somebody and they're now I'm working out of Canada and we actually aren't, we don't have PAs. They have to be you, to work in our costume shop, you have to be part of a union, so we can't have a PA. But when I have a junior costumer who can be very fresh and new, um, if someone asks you to sweep the floor, you just do it, and right. you do it with a smile. And then if you've got nothing to do, which doesn't exist, you go fold the shopping bags, or you go clean the mugs up in the kitchen, or and do it without being asked. Yeah, self-motivated. This, this self-starter initiative stuff is so important. And that's, that, that will get you into the next step. And you sometimes have to do it for a year, maybe even two. It doesn't happen in three months. Just because you graduated last week, you will not get a position in a month's time just because you swept a floor once. So you have to keep up with it and keep going. And somebody will see it and will appreciate it and will push you up the next rung, you know, so. Well, I also feel like because those are the skills that make a good designer or customer. Like I am metaphorically cleaning someone's coffee cups without being asked every day, all day long. And like I, metaphorically leaving the floor and self-motivating and thinking ahead and troubleshooting yeah. and wondering what you need and getting it before you yeah. know it. So like, I feel like, yes, like it's being persistent in a really gentle and kind way and staying in it and staying there. And once you get there, like giving it your all. And I, I think you will, you'll get in the union and people will notice you and they'll want to hire you because you'll be such an asset to their team. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've also um, talked to a lot of um, upstarters asking, you know, especially with this downtime, it's so disheartening for all the brilliant students who just graduated from FITM UCLA here in town, Woodbury, all the wonderful fashion schools and FITM especially is, uh, what they can do with this time off and, and they just feel so uh, hopeless. But what I've said is like, keep practicing your illustrations and every day just pick something like, okay, today I'm gonna study um, this history or I'm going to learn to sketch with this. And, and, and just every day, how can I 
keep improving in what either what you already graduated and know, but uh, or study film like this week is going to be 1920s films. This week is going to be talkies. This was going to be an and 60s and just pick it and go for it and learn it. And you never that way you don't just sit around waiting and feeling hopeless and you're 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 pushing yourself forward and you're putting it out in the universe that, that you know this is what I want and. Mm -hmm. You never know. You might do 60s week week watching movies, and the next show you get is 60s, and you're gonna be like, I know that. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> so true. Well, I think we need to wrap it up with that, and I really appreciate bringing you all here to FITM today, but also from all the different areas that you are in the world right now. It's incredible that we can sit down and have these conversations and invite all the people around the world to hear what you have to say because of your fantastic experience, your camaraderie, your collaboration, your talent, your creativity. There are too many adjectives because what you do is inspire so much of us um, by what we get to see visually and how that represents the world that we live in today and how it's going to inspire the world uh, and the, the creative arts to come. And you know, I'm a historian. I really live so much in the past. And I appreciate when I see what you bring to screen because I recognize it. One thing that I have to say is that I'm so thankful that you shared very, very personal stories and the true aspects of, of how you got to where you are and what it is that you do and how much you enjoy it. But the aspect of being persistent because you know, in my field as well, it is a very small field and I feel very privileged to be in it. And I know each one of you feel the same way about being these fantastic costume designers um, on the big screen, on the little screen and at every screen. Um, and, you know, I am asked all the time about how I, how do you become a curator? It's just like, how do you become a costume designer? Or how do you become anything in life? It's, you have to be interested in it, you have to study it, you have to go the extra mile, you have to be passionate, and you have to be persistent. And you will be successful in some way. And I, and I see that with all of you, and you definitely have inspired me greatly today, and I appreciate that very, very much. Um, I, I wish you all the best, and that we get through COVID really, really fast because we wanna bring all of your costumes back into our galleries. They would be there right now. We would be having our students and visitors coming and ooing and aahing and um, so forth. But we're hoping that next year all will be better and we'll be able to um, maybe have you here in, live and in person. It would be really fantastic. It'd be wonderful. But I wanna thank you all again for joining uh, me, Kevin Jones, tonight uh, live from the FITA Museum. Good luck, everybody. It was so nice talking to you. Good luck. Nice to meet you all. Thank Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> Bye. Love you all. Take Bye. care. Good night. Bye, Lou. And thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.